Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from the channel's television. Reporting tonight, Melinda Akilami. Hello and welcome. Tonight, Labour Party presidential candidate Peter B and other speakers at a forum in Enugu call for serious attention to issues of equity, fairness and justice as a way to achieve a united country. Residents of communities in Akwa local government area of Benue State appeal to the federal government to deploy more military personnel to their area following recent deadly attacks there. Hours to the April 30th date given by the Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Lovatunde Fashola, for the completion of the Lagos Ibado Expressway, road users continue to grapple with nerve wracking gridlock and insecurity. Fighting rages in Sudan despite ceasefire agreement between the warring generals. The country's former prime minister warns that the conflict could be worse than those in Syria and Libya. On business news tonight, Securities and Exchange Commission opens regulatory portal for fintech operators in the Nigerian capital market. And on sports news tonight, Falcon is set to begin preparations for next month's Rafa B Under-20 Women's Championship as coach Christopher Danjuma invites 30 players to come. build a nation where all citizens can inspire to any position without discrimination was at the heart of discussions at the second edition of the Handshake Across Nigeria event held in Enugu and organized by Uzuko Umunna, an Igbo social cultural group. At the event, the 2023 presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. Peter B, reiterated his call for a new Nigeria while the keynote speaker, Chief Mike Ozekume, maintained that for the handshake across Nigeria to happen, leaders must ensure equal opportunity for all Nigerians. In the same event, and in the same spirit, Chief Ozekume also pleaded with the president to release the pro-Biafra agitator, Mr. Namdi Kanu. Eminent personalities from across the country gather in this hall in Enugu State for the second edition of the Handshake Across Nigeria, a program organized by an Igbo sociocultural group, Nzuko Umunna, and dedicated to expanding friendships and cementing bonds between the Igbos and other nationalities in the country. The state governor, Ifani Ogwani, and the Labour Party presidential candidate, Peter Obi, also joined the national discourse. The keynote speaker, Mr. Michael Zekome, centers his speech around the theme of the event, which is building bridges for a new Nigeria. Strengthening the developments of agriculture, encouraging industrial development, human capital development, developing small and medium scale enterprises, maintenance of political, social, as well as macro economic stability, creating a sound financial system, leadership that prioritizes citizens' welfare. He also uses the opportunity to plead with President Muhammad Buhari to release Namdi Kanu, as according to him, it is within his purview to do so. Here is calling on President Buhari, please sir, on my bended knees, on my bended knees, you can order the release of Namdi Kanu today. You can do it through the Attorney General of the Federation who has the powers to enter a null prosecute, discontinuance of the cases. After all, there is even no case now. It's just being held illegally. Let him go. The Torotiv, who is the chairman of the occasion, and a former senator and activist, Mr. Sheh Husani, advocates prioritizing equity, fairness, and justice as the way forward. If we take this and join hands in the handshake in Nigeria, 
Nigeria will definitely graduate from what we now have to a new Nigeria. But in doing this, there must be equity. As a nation, we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. It's a fact that 109 years since amalgamation of Nigeria and over six decades since our political independence, we are still struggling to have a united and peaceful nation. And that is only possible if we entrench justice, fairness, and togetherness as part of our national ethos. For Mr. Peter Obi, his message is still the same, a new Nigeria for the future generation. We need a new Nigeria. A Nigeria where those of us, people who we are son of nobody, will be great, live well, have a job, earn a living. That's all we want. As this edition of the program comes to a close, the organizers and participants are hopeful of a better Nigeria devoid of ethnic bias or religious sentiments. The security matters now. Residents of Opaha and Adiku communities in APA local government area of Benue State are appealing to the federal government to establish a military base in their communities to enable them return home and prevent further attacks. They made the request following the recent attack on the community, which left many dead, including two military personnel. Opaha and the Diku communities are a shadow of what they used to be. The commercial nerve center of Apa local government area is deserted following Tuesday's attacks by suspected herdsmen. When the dust settles, 11 corpses were recovered by the survivors, while eyewitnesses say two soldiers also lost their lives in a bid to ward off the attackers. We don't know what occurred to instigate them by doing this. We didn't kill their cow, we didn't touch them. They first came, they live in Ediku. Ediku people didn't touch them. They first strike Ediku man in his farm. We don't know what prompted them to that. So we are looking up to, 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 to government to come to our aid. Their remains have been laid in these mass graves while the communities remain ghost towns, just like Ankali, where five people were killed. A legislator representing Apa State constituency calls for help. The villagers were helpless. We have nothing to do. You could see what, you have, uh, what has happened to the community. Everybody has been displaced. It was my candid plea and assistance to beg the federal government to, as a matter of urgency, deploy a security agency to the community so that the villagers can return back to their ancestral home to go about their farming uh, activities. From the displaced communities, leaders of the affected areas, including the lawmaker and the commissioner of finance, who represented Governor Tom, meet with the IDPs to consult them and assure them that everything is being done to end insecurity across the land. My people are displaced. It's painful that we've lost a lot, lot of lives in a local government in the past few weeks. As a people, we are helpless. And that is why I've called on the three tiers of government to join hands together with His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Benin State, with what he has started to make sure that um, we we'll properly and permanently address this problem and put it to rest. Community leaders say at least 22 persons have been killed in the last two weeks in three communities of Apa local government area, which is not too far from the Agatu area, where attacks have been a source of concern. Still talking security, but this time in Zamfara State, where 74 of the 185 persons abducted from Wanzamai village in South Africa, local government area by armed bandits have regained their freedom. Channel Television gathered that they were released after the payment of six million naira ransom to their abductors. A resident in the village said that the bandits released 74 of the captives, killed two, and kept others in captivity. The victims were brought to the village in vehicles and taken to hospital for medical attention, as many of them could not walk properly after their ordeal with the kidnappers. The armed bandits 
on April the 7th, 2023, abducted 185 persons, mostly women and children, from Wanzamai village and demanded 50 million naira ransom. They also asked the authorities in the state to withdraw soldiers deployed to the community as part of the conditions before releasing the victims. But the State Commissioner for Security, retired DIG, Maman Safe, said that the state government will not withdraw the military personnel deployed to that community. The state police command had earlier claimed that only nine persons were abducted during the incident. In Brown State, Governor Babagana Zulum has praised the Nigerian army for restoring security in communities formerly under the control of Boko Haram insurgents, leading to the safe return of the residents. However, the governor says, with successes recorded in the fight against the insurgency, addressing the root causes of terrorism is still top priority in his administration. He was speaking during the Send Forth dinner organized by the 7th Division in honor of the former GOC and Commander Sector 1 Operation Hadinkai, Major General Wadi Shoibu in Medugri. The gala was put together in honor of the former GOC and Commander Sector 1 Operation Hadin Kai, Major General Waidi Shuaibu, who has been posted out of the theater of war after 14 successful months, which saw the massive surrender of Boko Haram insurgents. Peking selected commanders in the Northeast Joint Operations for Praise, Professor Zulum emphasizes the strategic alliance of his administration with military formations across the Northeast. The only way to defeat the insurgency is to strengthen the resilience of government. The insurgency has triggered acute humanitarian and post slavery crisis, with devastating social and economic impact on the population, further deepening fragility and poverty in the Northeast South region. So the only human thing that we can do is to address the root causes of the insurgency, which are not limited to endemic poverty, but many diseases, high social impacts, environmental degradation, climate change, drug abuse, amongst others. The governor also expresses concern over activities of humanitarian organizations in the state, saying his administration has taken steps to streamline and regulate their activities. Right now, we have more than 250 international organizations and local NGOs, international and local NGOs, we must have this issue. Many of them are good. We know them. They are working very well. But the proliferation of NGOs and NGOs, without monitoring and evaluating their performances in the state, is something that we need to check out. The former GOC who has been deployed to the Army Resources Center Abuja recounts his experience commanding Sector 1 of the Operation Hadinkai Joint Task Force. All the operations we completed, operations we conducted in Yale, Gezwa, Gagash, Ngore, uh, Alafa A, Alafa B, Sambisa, Njimia, Pariso, you name it. All of those are really measurable experiences. And my appreciation also goes to those that all my officers and men that have contributed to us for all the successes are achieved. Professor Babagana Zulum says the next four years of his administration will build on the gains recorded in the area of security to achieve medium and long-term development plans already being implemented. In part two, after the break, the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors issues a two-week deadline to the federal government to address their demands or face a nationwide strike. That's in a moment. Join us again. Back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10, live on Channel Television Lagos. A reminder of our main stories. 
Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi and other speakers at a forum in Enugu call for serious attention to issues of equity, fairness and justice as a way to achieve a united country. Residents of communities in our power local government area of Benue State appeal to the federal government to deploy more military personnel to their area following recent deadly attacks there. Less than two hours to April the 30th date given by the Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babatunde Fashola, for the completion of the Lagos Ibado Expressway, road users continue to grapple with nerve-wracking gridlock and insecurity. Fighting rages in Sudan despite ceasefire agreement between the warring generals. The country's former prime minister warns that the conflict could be worse than that of Syria and Libya. The Catholic bishop of Sokoto Diocese Matthew Puka has once again condemned the effects of insecurity, especially as it affects education in the country. The outspoken cleric says that the terrorists behind the kidnappings and killings across the country represent darkness which must be eradicated from the land. Part of the way to achieve this, according to Bishop Puka, is through adequate education of the population. He was speaking at the Parents' Summit of the 2023 Education Week in Benin City, the Edo State Capital. Yeah, our country is now being ravaged and threatened by the forces of darkness. Those who have said no to humanity and those who have said no to education, whether they manifest themselves in the excesses, the murderous excesses, and the destructive excesses of Boko Haram, banditry, a people of darkness that we must, as a country, fight with every drop of our blood to physically ensure that they are pushed back. Because without it, we have no future as a country. Not only have they destroyed the image of the country, they've destroyed the image of religion, they've made us victims and suspects. So really, no distance is too much for me to cover when it comes to education. The president of Costa Rica, I met him at a conference many years ago, and it was a conference in America on military rule in Africa. When I finished my presentation, he walked up to me and said, Father, you spoke very well. I was very impressed with your presentation. Then he said to me, but you know you can, you can eliminate the army in your country. I said, what do you mean? Then you can eliminate, you don't need the military. I said, ah, Oga, we can't talk like that. Though. He said, in my country, we have no military. We have eliminated the military. And he said, instead of the military, we have invested in education. Today, Costa Rica, for the last few years, last many years, has the highest threshold of educated people. Almost 90% or more than 90%. And the president's argument was that if we can educate our people, they will become a military. Because they can defend themselves. They can defend their country. To all the stories now, the president-elect, Senator Bola Tinubu, returned to Lagos from the nation's capital, Abuja, this evening. It's his first visit to the States since he returned from his trip to Europe on Monday. Shortly after his plane landed at the Muritala Mohammed International Airport, the president-elect could be seen leaving the arrival wing to his residence. Another round of industrial action by medical workers appears to be looming in the country as the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors, NAD, has issued a two-week deadline to the federal government to address their demands or face a nationwide strike. The doctors are demanding, amongst other things, a 200% salary increase for their members. Immediate withdrawal of the bill that seeks to prevent them from traveling abroad until after five years of practice in Nigeria. 
They are also demanding the payment of all salary arrears owed to their members from 2014 to 2016, as well as arrears of the consequential adjustment of the minimum wage. The doctors took the resolution at the end of the extraordinary National Executive Council meeting, which took place in Abeokuta, the Ogun State Capital. Now let's talk about doctors as a profession. They dedicate their lives to the pursuit of wellness for others in a career that can be said to be daunting, requiring intense schooling, constant training, and quite a chaotic schedule. Our correspondent Victoria Longjohn spent a day with some medical doctors and has this report. Yeah, I'll be there soon. Dr. Eme Keshi is a consultant family physician in a private hospital in the Federal Capital Territory. From the moment she walks in, she has just a little time before her day begins. Good morning, madam. How are you today? Her job is nothing short of demanding, attending to the many needs of patients. At 8 o'clock, we start with huddles. And so huddles are little meetings where, by departments, we talk about the challenges, the strengths of the day that passed, and then plan for the day ahead. When we're done with that meeting, I go for my ward rounds. Okay, so ward rounds are led by the consultant um, and then um, one or two other doctors. Okay, and then nurses, the nurses who are attending to the patient. And so in the, during the ward rounds, it's a, it's a wonderful time for us to interact with our patients. And practicing medicine has been one of the highest joys of my life. It's given me the opportunity to um, reach out to people to to solve problems. I have passion for medicine, so I think it's been wonderful. Okay, especially when you see a woman in labor and then you come and take the delivery, and the mother, the baby, the husband, everybody is feeling happy and telling you thank you. So it's um, actually satisfying when you go through that kind of experience. While Dr. Keshi and Dr. Idoko might have good working experiences. The story is not the same for others. The mental stress um, for the physicians themselves and also for helping the people that you are planning to see as a doctor yourself. So it puts a lot of stress on you. And of course, most of the times as well, you have um, difficulty in the environment you're working in and you have troubles with the things you need to work with and sometimes um, it makes your work very difficult and sluggish. The World Health Organization puts the doctor to patient ratio at 1 to 600 standard. However, Nigeria's doctor to patient ratio of 1 to 5,000 falls below the global recommendation. With an estimated population of over 200 million people, the country requires at least 363,000 additional doctors to meet this target. As at April 2022, the Nigerian Medical and Dental Council, from their registry, out of the 110 doctors that have been registered in Nigeria from inception, presently, as at then, there were only 55,000 left. And if we conduct that statistics as we speak, I'm not sure it's up to 30,000 doctors in Nigeria today. For the sacrifices doctors make to save lives daily, one would naturally assume the reward of a lifelong journey will be plentiful. Because of the difficulty in the economic structure that we have, it makes it even more difficult to cope you know, with what we get and with the economic situation. So it actually doesn't favor the doctors or any health worker, so it's difficult. The remuneration, your take on pay, is a major driving factor. The Nigerian doctors are the least paid doctors all over the world. It's indeed a sad reality that Nigerian doctors are among the least paid globally. With expectations of them so high, 
a tough working environment and abysmal pay. Some of them have resorted to migrating abroad for greener pastures. To be honest, we do not have any moral justification to stop or discourage any of our younger colleagues from leaving. As a matter of fact, it is not only the younger ones that are leaving. The intermediate and older doctors are also leaving. For me, leaving, like I say, is an option for everybody, including myself. Medicine in Nigeria is going somewhere, and um, I really encourage doctors to stay back, you know, and build what we have here. Dr. Enekeshi and others have made a choice to serve the country. They wake up every day with their patients on their mind, despite the enormous demands of the job and poor working conditions and remuneration. However, the government must do more in terms of funding, human resource development, procurement of equipment, amongst others, to enhance the health sector and encourage more doctors to save lives. Victoria Long John, Channels Television News. The dust raised following the introduction of the Naira redesign policy may not have settled completely as Nigerians count down to the December 31st new deadline. Now from the last day of this year, the old 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira denominations should give way to the new. While the Central Bank of Nigeria reports that the currency in circulation is up by 71%, a bulk of this remains the old Naira notes, raising uncertainty about its availability. In this next report, our business correspondent, Ini John Mekwa, revisits this issue. The Central Bank of Nigeria Act, just like many others globally, empowers it to redesign and change the country's currency between five to eight years. When a Naira redesign policy was announced in October 2022 to begin circulation in December, about three months before a general election, many questions were asked, to which the CBN governor, Mr. Godwin Emefili, attempted to provide answers. We aim to support the efforts of our security agencies in combating banditry and ransom taking in Nigeria through this program, and we can see that the military are making a good progress in this important task in Nigeria. Analysts had perceived the outcome of the policy differently. One of them, economist and chief executive officer of financial derivatives company, Mr. Bismarck Rwani, saw more negative impacts from the policy. If you take the assumption that, if, that all, almost all trades in the markets and the informal markets are settled by cash and only marginally by POS, you'll find that the velocity of circulation of money, which is very important, is 16 times. This is very complicated. But what it does mean is that three times in a month, a woman who is selling rice or gari and all of that, turns her money, sells, and takes the money to buy back. If the cash is trapped, then you have, you have actually stopped her from earning money. To in the same line of thought, the chief executive officer policy. of Center for the for Promotion of Private policies. Enterprise, Dr. Muda Yusuf, said the policy will hurt the Naira. If you have a currency that is rapidly deteriorating in value, there's a tendency to move from that currency into other currencies or to move from that currency into other asset classes. The predictions of the economy seem fulfilled because by the end of February, when the CBN was applauding the success of the redesigned policy with the announcement that currency in circulation had dipped by more than 200% to 982.09 billion naira from 3.29 trillion naira, many Nigerians were spending hours at ATMs and banks to withdraw their money. Players in the real sector were pressured an adverse effect has been captured in their books. Our members suffered, businesses suffered. Um, on one instance, those selling food items lost a lot of food items, especially the consumable ones, because there was no money available. This squeeze spread to other parts of the economy. Frustration led to peaceful protests, which eventually turned violent in some places. There was destruction and looting at some ATMs. Banks had to shut down to protect their staff from the anger of customers who could not access or spend their money. 
Acknowledging the challenge, the President Muhammad Buhari encouraged Nigerians to bear a temporary pain for long-term benefits. A calculation by the Association of Senior Staff of Banks, Insurance and Financial Institutions indicated that banks lost the sum of 5 billion naira to destruction across the country. When the pressure became overwhelming, some governors introduced the legal angle, asking the courts to extend the usage of the old naira. Their wish was granted when eventually the Supreme Court ruled that the old Naira remains legal till December the 31st, 2023. While this seems a long time in the future, the expectation is that the old and new Naira would circulate together until the old is completely withdrawn. But opposite seems to be the reality. Anywhere you go is the old Naira not. Even on the machine you can see it's only the old Naira not there this dispenser. Even my customer now is not using, I am using only transfer with them. It seems as if the money is fading away. Unfortunately, attempts to get the perspective and updates on the new Naira from the CBN has been unfruitful. The promise by the CBN's head of corporate communication to respond remains to be fulfilled. There are fears that with the current trend, Nigerians may still find it tough to get the new note as the deadline draws closer. On the other hand, there are conversations as to the direction of the incoming administration. The administration was to decide that we want to use the old notes. All I would recommend is they go through the process. What the Supreme Court had said ought to have been done, such that no other person would say, oh, even this decision was unilaterally taken. More questions linger on the mind of many Nigerians, including have the objectives of the policy been achieved and will all the hardship and economic loss associated with the narrow redesign policy be in vain? Ini John Mekwa, Channels Television News. The Lagos State Government has demolished 13 buildings in the Ajawa State area sited in close proximity to the Muritala International Airport in Lagos. According to the general manager of the Lagos State Building Control Agency, Mr. Agbola Hoki, the buildings were constructed on aviation fuel pipelines and do not have the required government permits. He also raised concern over the risk of possible fire outbreak from the pipeline in the area. The problem that we are having is attitude problem. You heard what he said, because somebody has built his own, he's living there, he did Christmas there. So I want to do a legal idea on my own too. Forgetting that there are principles, that there are laws. And when you now see those buildings, they don't have approval. This sums up the major cause of building collapses in Lagos State. A matter that has become worrisome to residents. And to check the menace, Government officials from the State Building Control Agency visit the airport area of Lagos to demolish 13 illegal structures constructed on pipelines along Airport Road. puts an end to eight years of efforts to rid the pipeline of illegal structures. If you come to a planning office, they will even advise you better. And I know that the district officer, the planning permit has given them, told them that there is no way they can build there. But they still turn the deaf here because they want to build in that environment. The due diligence has been done by Lagos State Building Control. I'm telling you that for free. Or uh, with all aspects, with all the agencies, and even with Fedra. So it wasn't as if they just the building control is going there because they don't have building plan approval in loan. The place is not authorized for anybody to build. The Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria is also aware of the lingering issue and commends the Lagos State Government for stepping in to avert any crisis. Since 2016, that we placed adverts in national buildings, advertised in our local radio and television houses here. So since then, 
some of them will say, uh, is it since 2016, they have forgotten about it. Uh, it's about government. This government will come and go. We are all this nice they are doing. It will also die. The real estate sector may require close monitoring and adherence to construction guidelines to curb further building collapses. You said that the Lagos Ibadan Expressway will be delivered between April and May. Is the that contractors are expected to finish on the 30th of April. Uh, so I repeat what I said. The, from the Lagos end to the Ibadan end. Right now the contractor has mobilized, the last time I went, 110 different machines, equipment there, and 450 people in terms of manpower there. They're running all stations are going now to see that they keep up with that date. So April 30th, that's what we should be expecting. Fingers The Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babatunde Fashola, when asked about the completion of the Lagos Ibadan Road project on our program Sunday Politics. Now it's less than two hours to D Day, that's tomorrow, April the 30th, as the deadline mentioned by the Minister of Works and Housing for the completion of the construction work on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. Why that ultimatum appears no longer visible, the impact of work on commuters and motorists is agonizing with the resultant congestion stretching beyond Kara to Ududu Bega, Halakere, Ikorudu Road, and other parts of the metropolis. However, as road users continue to lament the worsening gridlock, the situation has also provided an opportunity for criminals to carry out attacks, especially on the Long Bridge. Our correspondent, Kelly Egiga, captured the situation in this report. The Lagos Ibado Expressway, a 127.6 kilometer long highway, is a major route which connects the western, northern, and eastern parts of Nigeria. More than this, the highway is the most viable corridor economically. It's the busiest highway in the country, handling an average of 250,000 passenger car units on a daily basis. In spite of all these characteristics, the road also suffers from security black spots. Mentioned among such spots are the Kara and Long Bridge areas, as well as Mowe and Ofada settlements along the road. These areas have had reports of traffic robbery, kidnap, and sometimes killings by gunmen among criminal activities, especially at night. And for some who work and stay in these border communities and are compelled to close at night, they have been left with terrific and horrible memories. On that particular night, I, I got to the bridge around 8.30 p.m. Somebody just came to my uh, window and knocked and said, um, Oga, give me your phone. Oga, give us money. One of them forced his hand into the car, unlocked it, opened the door, dragged me out of the car. Before I knew what would happen, he just carried me, threw me under the bridge. This car breaks down in the middle of the long bridge. But many say if this happens at night, it will be safer to run for your life than attempt to fix your car. As we continue our quest, we make an audacious stop under the bridge. We are under the long bridge and it looks absolutely calm in the day. But reports and stories have said that at night this place turns lively and has been described as a den for kidnappers. But let's show you some of our findings here. For instance, take a look at this bag right here on the floor. I may have to touch it because I have noticed something that we must put out there. It's a bag and it looks like it has been searched and there have been reports of uh, robbery activities on the bridge and this perhaps tells what plays out.
down here under the long bridge we have to move around the long bridge and show you some other findings we can see here there are lots of empty packs of takeaway uh there are clothing clothing materials as well there are empty sachet of alcoholic drinks a lot a lot of them we can see on uh under the long bridge area here empty packs of some other food items and canned drinks and all of that this is another uh clothing material we can see here it looks like this perhaps has just happened maybe a few hours ago or a few days ago because it really looks uh, uh still a bit tidy so it looks calm in the day but at night it's a different situation and then there is another discovery so we are still here on the long bridge area but uh, the alternative routes on the long bridge and we have discovered something that looks like um a path or a pathway we're not exactly sure what exactly it is but what we can tell you our viewers is that we have seen some clothing materials on the floor we have this uh, uh pink lace here a purple lace here on uh the ground or the floor and we can also see that inside this pathway here there are two uh, other pieces of that same material and there are other clothing materials as well uh in this path we're not exactly sure what exactly takes place in here but i am absolutely absolutely curious uh to find out what exactly uh, goes on inside this pathway because we can see a lot of clothing materials here uh, i mean i'm wondering just why there's also the question as to why is this barricade open it looks to me like it has been vandalized uh, by these criminals who of course there have been reports of activities on the long bridge area where people have been kidnapped or attacked and then they are rushed to places like this some road users and residents believe the construction work which has been ongoing for almost 20 years now is at the heart of some of these attacks but when there's a diversion as a result of the ongoing construction or rehabilitation work, motorists spend at least two to six hours on this axis. And this is a cash-out moment for criminals to strike. We decide to return to the Long Bridge at night to see the situation. The corridor is dark with no security lights and atmosphere where criminality thrives. I am curious to go under the bridge, but was told it's too dangerous. The evidence of this restructuring is not immediately visible. However, during this trip, we come across two policemen. The first threw out our special coverage of this particular report. They tell us that they patrol the bridge on their motorcycle, but only at night but how much of an impact this has on deterring criminal activities on this axis is absolutely debatable. The command is paying a very serious attention to that place because we don't want a situation where people who are uh, applying that road from uh, the day in day out to be having uh, any encounter with all this hoodlum. But you know, in some uh, instances, there, are, there will always be an opportunistic uh, uh, commission of crime there yeah, because the police will not be everywhere all the time. Those hoodlums, too, they used to study the police. At times, they would jump out suddenly, and uh, we have arrested many of them. I'm aware of these things. And for the ones that fall within Lagos State, particularly Pega, which is under Lagos State, we, we, we take it up, we tackle it headlong. And for those that fall outside Lagos State, no matter how close they are to Lagos State, uh, we we, in addition to referring people to Ogun State Police Command, we also do our best to reach out to Ogun State Police Command to let them know that such a thing happened. What is, however not debatable, is the aching need for greater and more security, both in terms of infrastructure, such as street lights, as well as motorized and stationary patrol, to mention but a few. Kelly, a giga. Channels Television News. Let's return to Edo State at the Parents' Summit of the 2023 Education Week, where Governor Godwin Obaseki is promising to ensure the state education curriculum includes skill empowerment for students. 
Bovno Obaseki also gave insights into the state's education reform programs. The Testa Junior are going to join up. The potpourri of activities to mark the 2023 Education Week reaches its peak with this parent summit inside the Victor Waifu Creative Hub in Benin City, the Edo State Capital. Some new thing that white people have discovered. From the market women, the clergy, uniformed personnel, the Edo State Government believes that all stakeholders should be part of the plan to revamp reading and learning in public schools. We have discovered that in the last six years of education reform, that old students, old pupils, are very involved in our schools. Even community, through the school-based management committee, they are very, very involved in our schools. But we are, start, we are seeing that we don't yet have enough parents who are involved in the activities of school. So today's summit is for us to sit down and rub minds. Parents in the audience take the Do No Harm pledge to validate their support for the state government's initiatives in providing access to quality education. The keynote speaker, Bishop Matthew Kuka, starts his presentation with stories to illustrate the values of education in the society. He ends with a Singapore education template as one for countries to emulate. After you finish primary school in Singapore, this, listen, children should be able to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. They must learn the art of sharing and putting other people first. Okay? They must know how to build friendship with other children. They must develop a sense of intellectual curiosity. And they must know how to think and how to express themselves. Edo State Governor Mr. Godwin Obaseki underlines some key points in his education reforms agenda since 2018 when Edo Best program came on board. For us, the last five years have been an interesting ride. We've been able to undertake fundamental reforms in our, business, in our schools. And you parents, you see it in the children every day. How did we do it? First, we have made the teachers more important. We have introduced technology. Now we know when the teacher is not in school. We know when the pupil is not in school. The communities are now involved in our reform. The state government says the plans to improve reading and learning has been made open to the public through the Edo Education Week. What is now left is for stakeholders and residents to throw their weight behind the Edo State Basic Education Sector Transformation, also known as Edo Best. We now bring you visuals of the President-elect Senator Bola Ahmed Tinumbu's return to Lagos from the nation's capital Abuja this evening. It's his first visit to the state since he returned from his trip to Europe on Monday. Shortly after his plane landed at the Murutala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos, the president-elect could be seen leaving the arrival wing to his residence. Now let's find out what's happening in the world of business. And Wawudu has details. Thank you, Melinda. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Nigerian Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, says that it has opened the regulatory portal for fintech companies operating or seeking to operate their businesses in Nigeria's capital market. The statement from the SEC also explains that the move is coming after the 2021 agreement announcing the regulatory incubation program for fintech firms that want to be players in the country's capital market. According to the commission, the portal will be open from today, April the 28th, to May the 26th this year. The market regulator adds that companies seeking to apply and participate in the regulatory incubation program must meet the five eligibility criteria, which include a genuine innovation that introduces a new product or process to serve specific investor needs, proof of safety for investors, application in the Nigeria capital market, ability to solve existing compliance or supervisory issues, and be ready for testing. 
Meanwhile, the World Bank has advised the Nigerian government to increase the country's oil revenue as it seeks ways to restore macroeconomic stability. The International Finance Institution made this known in a month's edition of its macro poverty outlook. The World Bank also says that high oil prices have previously supported the Nigerian economy until the year 2021, as macroeconomic stability weakened in the midst of declining oil production, costly fuel subsidies, and exchange rate distortions. Let's take a look at this week's trading performance at the local equities market. Investor sentiments ended at the last trading sessions of April with significant gain as the benchmark index and the equities total value rose by more than 2%. But within another holiday shortened four trading days, the activity chart ended positive as a total volume and value of number of deals carried out this week were significantly higher, and that's in contrast to the activities recorded on the NGX just last week. Sectoral performance was mostly positive except for the oil and gas sector index of the market, while the shares of Boa Foods, MTN Niger, and Etel Africa credited for gains recorded within the week. For Honeywell Flower, it topped the list of 49 gainers with 34.91% increase in its share price. Nigerian brewers let 16 other losers down by 11.48%, while the trio of Transco, Access, and Fidelity Bank were the top three contributors to more than 14 million shares traded this week. And that ends business news for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Melinda. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Many thanks, Anne. The Secretary General of the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, Mr. Georges Chikoti, says the Nigerian government has agreed to provide a center of excellence to serve as an official and organized link between Africans in diaspora and other countries. He addressed a press conference in Abuja on the sidelines of the Global African Diaspora Symposium organized by NITCOM and explains that the center will help coordinate those in diaspora to participate in the development of their countries. Now let's find out what's happening in the world of sports. Kelly Egiga is standing by with those details. Thanks, Melinda. In the world of sports, coach Chris Danjuma has called 30 players to campus. Nigeria's Falconets uh, begin preparations on Monday for the next month's Rafa B under 20 women's championship taking place in Ghana. Danjuma has included some players from the FIFA under 20 women's World Cup quarterfinalists in Costa Rica, as well as some from the bronze medal winning Flamingos from the FIFA under 17 women's World Cup in India alongside a couple of new faces. The Wafu B under 20 women's tournament will take place in Ghana from May 20th to June 4th. Invited players are expected to arrive at the Wuye Abuja tomorrow for that preparation. Away from the local scene in the English Premier League now, Crystal Palace deservedly urged a seven-goal thriller against West Ham to reach the 40-point mark targeted by manager Roy Hudson with a 4-3 victory over the Hammers at Sehos Park. Elsewhere, a late fight back from Brentford end then precious three points as the defeated relegation threatened Nottingham Forest, two goals to one. Brighton also reunited the push for a place in Europe next season by beating Wolves 6-0 to record their biggest ever top flight victory. And thousands of Napoli fans gathered in Spanish quarters of Naples to stand in solidarity with their team ahead of the possible title win of Serie A. And away from football, Russia's Daniel Medvedev has made a rock-solid start to his Mutual Madrid Open campaign with a 6-4, 6-3 win against Italian qualifier Andre Vavasori. And that's Post News tonight. Thanks indeed for watching. I am Kelly Egiga. It's back to Melinda. Many thanks, Kelly. 
Despite the extension of a ceasefire by another 72 hours between the warring Sudanese generals, fighting has continued to rock the country. There have been regular air, tank and artillery strikes in parts of Khartoum and the surrounding area. Leader of the paramilitary rapid support forces, General Mohamed Dagalo, better known as Hamedi, is complaining that his fighters are being relentlessly bombed since the truce extension and he ruled out any negotiation until the fighting ceases. His rival and head of Sudan's regular army, General Buran, has agreed to face-to-face -face talks in South Sudan for now. Meanwhile, the country's former Prime Minister, Abdallah Hamdok, is warning that the conflict in his country could be worse than those in Syria and Libya. According to him, the fighting will be a nightmare for the world if it continues. More than 500 people have been killed and over 4,000 injured in the crisis. That's according to figures from the Sudanese Health Ministry, with tens of thousands fleeing the troubled country. And the main news again. The Labour Party presidential candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, and other speakers at a forum in Enugu today called for serious attention to issues of equity, fairness and justice as the way to achieve a united country. Residents of communities in Apa local government area of Benue State have appealed to the federal government to deploy more military personnel to their area following recent deadly attacks there. That's the